Hi, my lovelies! Thank you for coming back and joining me for the next part of the story. I was so excited to get back into it today. I mean, Edward has been through so much in the story. Let's see, first he was living with Abilene, and then he was thrown off the boat, right? And he was picked up by a fisherman, and the fisherman gave Edward to his wife, Nellie, and Nellie just loved Edward so much. And then their daughter, Lolly, came back, and she didn't like Edward very much, and she threw Edward in the trash. And then at the dump, Edward heard Ernest, who said that he was king of the world because he was king of the trash. And he was there for a pretty long time in the garbage. It must have been really smelly. But luckily, Lucy came and dug Edward up out of the trash, picked him up, and ran him with him over to Bull. And then Bull, Lucy, and Edward traveled together for a really long time, almost seven years. Seven years together. But sadly, when we left off yesterday, Edward had been kicked off of the train, and now he is alone. Let's see what happens to him next. Chapter 15 In the morning, the sun rose, and the cricket song gave way to bird song and an old woman came walking down the dirt road and tripped right over Edward. Hmm, she said. She pushed at Edward with her fishing pole. Looks like a rabbit, she said. She put down her basket and bent and stared at Edward. Only he ain't real. She stood back up. Hmm, she said again. She rubbed her back. What I say is, there's a use for everything, and everything has its use. That's what I say. Edward didn't care what she said. The terrible ache he had felt the night before had gone away and had been replaced with a different feeling, one of hollowness and despair. Pick me up or don't pick me up, the rabbit thought. It makes no difference to me. The old lady picked him up. She bent him double and put him in her basket which smelled of weeds and fish. And then she kept walking, swinging the basket and singing. Nobody knows the troubles I seen. Edward, in spite of himself, listened. I've seen troubles too, he thought. You bet I have. And apparently they aren't over yet. Edward was right. His troubles were not over. The old woman found a use for him. She hung him from a pole in her vegetable garden. She nailed his velvet ears to the wooden pole and spread his arms out as if he were flying and attached his paws to the pole by wrapping pieces of wire around them. In addition to Edward, pie tins hung from the pole. They clinked and clanked and shone in the morning sun. Ain't a doubt in my mind that you can scare them off, the old lady said. Scare who off? Edward wondered. Birds, he soon discovered. Crows. They came flying at him, cawing and screeching, wheeling over his head, diving at his ears. Go on, Clyde, said the woman. She clapped her hands. You gotta act ferocious. Clyde? Edward felt a weariness so intense wash over him that he thought he might actually be able to sigh out loud. Would the world never tire of calling him by the wrong name? The old woman clapped her hands again. Get to work, Clyde, she said. Scare them birds off. And then she walked away from him, out of the garden, and toward her small house. The birds were insistent. They flew around his head. They tugged at the loose threads in his sweater. One large crow, in particular, would not leave the rabbit alone. He perched on the pole and screamed a dark message in Edward's left ear. Caw, 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 without ceasing. As the sun rose higher and shone meaner and brighter, Edward became somewhat dazed. He mistook the large crow for Pellegrina. Go ahead, he thought. Turn me into a warthog if you want. I don't care. I am done with caring. Caw, caw said the Pellegrino crow. Finally, the sun set and the birds flew away. 
Edward hung by his velvet ears and looked up at the night sky. He saw the stars, but for the first time in his life, he looked at them and felt no comfort. Instead, he felt mocked. You are down there all alone, the stars seemed to say to him, and we are up here in our constellations together. I have been loved, Edward told the stars. So, said the stars, what difference does that make when you are all alone now? Edward could think of no answer to that question. Eventually, the sky lightened and the stars disappeared one by one. The birds returned and the old woman came back to the garden. She brought a boy with her. Chapter 16 Bryce, said the old woman, get away from that rabbit. I ain't paying you to stand and stare. Yes, ma'am, said Bryce. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand and continued to look up at Edward. The boy's eyes were brown, with flecks of gold shining in them. Hey, he whispered to Edward. A crow settled on Edward's head, and the boy flapped his arms and shouted, Go on, get! And the bird spread his wings and flew away. Bryce! shouted the old woman. Ma'am, said Bryce. Get away from that rabbit. Do your work. I ain't gonna say it again. Yes, m'm, said Bryce. He wiped his hand across his nose. I'll be back to get you, he said to Edward. The rabbit spent the day hanging by his ears, baking in the hot sun, watching the old woman and Bryce weed and hoe the garden. Whenever the woman wasn't looking, Bryce raised his hand and waved. The bird circled over Edward's head, laughing at him. What was it like to have wings, Edward wondered. If he had had wings when he was tossed overboard, he would not have sunk to the bottom of the sea. Instead, he would have flown in the opposite direction up into the deep bright blue sky. And when Lolly took him to the dump, he would have flown out of the garbage and followed her and landed on her head, holding on it with his sharp claws. And on the train, when the man kicked him, Edward would not have fallen to the ground. Instead, he would have risen up and sat on top of the train and laughed at the man. Caw, caw, caw. In the late afternoon, Bryce and the old lady left the field. Bryce winked at Edward as he walked past him. One of the crows lighted on Edward's shoulder and tapped with his beak at Edward's china face reminding the rabbit with each tap that he had no wings, that not only could he not fly, he could not move on his own at all, in any way. Dusk descended over the field, and then came true dark. A whippoorwill sang about over and over again. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. It was the saddest sound Edward had ever heard. And then came another song, the hum of a harmonica. Bryce stepped out of the shadows. Hey, he said to Edward. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand and then played another bit of song on the harmonica. I bet you didn't think I'd come back, but here I am. I come to save you. Too late, thought Edward, as Bryce climbed the pole and worked at the wires that were tied around his wrists. I am nothing but a hollow rabbit. Too late, thought Edward, as Bryce pulled the nails out of his ears. I am only a doll made of china. But when the last nail was out and he fell forward into Bryce's arms, the rabbit felt a rush of relief, and the feeling of relief was followed by one of joy. Perhaps, he thought, it is not too late after all for me to be saved. Bryce slung Edward over his shoulder. He started to walk. I come to get you for Sarah Ruth, said Bryce. You don't know Sarah Ruth. She's my sister. She's sick. She had her a baby doll made out of China. She loved that baby doll. But he broke it. He broke it. He was drunk and stepped on the baby's head and smashed it into a hundred million pieces. Them pieces was so small, I couldn't make them go back together. I couldn't. I tried and tried. At this point in his story, 
Bryce stopped walking and shook his head and wiped at his nose with the back of his hand. Sarah Ruth ain't had nothing to play with since. He won't buy her nothing. He says she don't need nothing. He says she don't need nothing because she ain't gonna live. But he don't know. Bryce started to walk again. He don't know, he said. Who he was was not clear to Edward. What was clear was that he was being taken to a child to make up for the loss of a doll. A doll. How Edward loathed dolls. And to be thought of as a likely replacement for a doll offended him. But still, it was, he had to admit, a highly preferable alternative to hanging by his ears from a post. The house in which Bryce and Sarah Ruth lived was so small and crooked that Edward did not believe at first that it was a house. He mistook it instead for a chicken coop. Inside there were two beds and a kerosene lamp and not much else. Bryce laid Edward at the foot of one of the beds and then lit the lamp. Sarah, Bryce whispered. Sarah Ruth, you gotta wake up now, honey. I brung you something. He took the harmonica out of his pocket and played the beginning of a simple melody. The little girl sat up in her bed and immediately started to cough. Bryce put his hand on her back. That's all right, he told her. That's okay. She was young, maybe four years old, and she had white blonde hair. And even in the poor light of the lamp, Edward could see that her eyes were the same gold-flecked brown as Bryce's. That's right, said Bryce. You go on ahead and cough. Sarah Ruth obliged him. She coughed and coughed and coughed. On the wall of the cabin, the kerosene light cast her trembling shadow, hunched over and small. The coughing was the saddest sound that Edward had ever heard, sadder even than the mournful call of the whip whippoorwill. Finally, Sarah Ruth stopped. Bryce says, you want to see what I brung you? Sarah nodded. You got to close your eyes. The girl closed her eyes. Bryce picked up Edward and held him so that he was standing straight like a soldier at the end of the bed. All right now, you can open them. Sarah Ruth opened her eyes and Bryce moved Edward's china legs and china arms so it looked as if he were dancing. Sarah Ruth laughed and clapped her hands. Rabbit, she said. He's for you, honey, said Bryce. Sarah Ruth looked first at Edward and then at Bryce and then back at Edward again, her eyes wide and disbelieving. He's yours. Mine? Sarah Ruth, Edward was soon to discover, rarely said more than one word at a time. Words, at least several of them strung together, made her cough. She limited herself. She said only what needed to be said. Yours, said Bryce. I got him special for you. This knowledge provoked another fit of coughing in Sarah Ruth, and she hunched over again. When the fit was done, she uncurled herself and held out her arms. That's right, said Bryce. He handed Edward to her. Baby, said Sarah Ruth. She rocked Edward back and forth and stared down at him and smiled. Never in his life had Edward been cradled like a baby. Abilene had not done it nor had Nellie, and most certainly Bull had not. It was a singular sensation to be held so gently and yet so fiercely, to be stared down at with so much love. Edward felt the whole of his china body flood with warmth. You going to give him a name, honey? Bryce asked. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth without taking her eyes off Edward. Jangles, huh? That's a good name. I like that name. Bryce patted Sarah Ruth on the head. She continued to stare down at Edward. Hush, she said to Edward as she rocked him back and forth. From the minute I first seen him, said Bryce, I knew he belonged to you. I said to myself, that rabbit is for Sarah Ruth for sure. Jangles, murmured Sarah Ruth. Outside the cabin, thunder cracked and then came the sound of rain falling on the tin roof. 
Sarah rocked Edward back and forth, back and forth, and Bryce took out his harmonica and started to play, making his song keep rhythm with the rain. Bryce and Sarah Ruth had a father. Early the next morning, when the light was gray and uncertain, Sarah Ruth was sitting up in bed, coughing, and the father came home. He picked Edward up by one of his ears and said, I ain't never. It's a baby doll, said Bryce. Don't look like no baby doll to me. Edward, hanging by one ear, was frightened. This, he was certain, was the man who crushed the heads of China dolls. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth between cough. She held out her arms. He's hers, said Bryce. He belongs to her. The father dropped Edward on the bed, and Bryce picked up the rabbit and handed him to Sarah Ruth. It don't matter anyway, said the father. It don't make no difference, none of it. It does so matter, said Bryce. Don't you sass me, said the father. He raised his hand and slapped Bryce across his mouth, and then he turned and left the house. You ain't got to worry about him, said Bryce to Edward. He ain't nothing but a bully, and besides, he don't hardly ever come home. Fortunately, the father did not come back that day. Bryce went out to work, and Sarah Ruth spent the day in bed, holding Edward in her lap and playing with a box filled with buttons. Pretty, she said to Edward, as she lined up the buttons on the bed and arranged them into different patterns. Sometimes, when a coughing fit was particularly bad, she squeezed Edward so tight that he was afraid he would crack in two. Also, in between coughing fits, she took to sucking on one or the other of Edward's ears. Normally, Edward would have, been, would have found intrusive, clinging behavior of this sort very annoying. But there was something about Sarah Ruth. He wanted to take care of her. He wanted to protect her. He wanted to do more for her. At the end of the day, Bryce returned with a biscuit for Sarah Ruth and a ball of twine for Edward. Sarah Ruth held the biscuit in both hands and took small, tentative bites. You eat that all up, honey. Let me hold Jangle, said Bryce. Him and me got a surprise for you. Bryce took Edward off in a corner. Sorry, Bryce took Edward off in a corner of the room, and with his pocket knife, he cut off links of twine and tied them to Edward's arms and feet, and then tied the twine to sticks of wood. See, all day I've been thinking about it, Bryce said. What we're going to do is make you dance. Sarah Ruth loves dancing. Mama used to hold on to her and dance her around the room. You eating that biscuit? Bryce called out to Sarah Ruth. Uh-huh, said Sarah Ruth. You hold on, honey. We got a surprise for you. Bryce stood up. Close your eyes, he told her. He took Edward over to the bed and said, Okay, you can open them now. Sarah Ruth opened her eyes. Dance, Jangles, said Bryce. And then, moving the strings with the sticks with his one hand, Bryce made Edward dance and drop and sway. And the whole while, at the same time with his other hand, he held on to the harmonica and played a bright and lively tune. Sarah Ruth laughed. She laughed until she started to cough and then Bryce laid Edward down and took Sarah Ruth in his lap and rocked her and rubbed her back. You want some fresh air? he asked her. Let's get you out of this nasty old air, huh? Bryce carried his sister outside. He left Edward lying on the bed, and the rabbit, staring up at the smoke-stained ceiling, thought again about having wings. If he had them, he thought, he would fly high above the world to where the air was clear and sweet, and he would take Sarah Ruth with him. He would carry her in his arms. Surely, so high above the world, she would be able to breathe without coughing. After a minute, Bryce came back inside, still carrying Sarah Ruth. She wants you too, he said. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth. She held out her arms. So Bryce held Sarah Ruth, and Sarah Ruth 
held Edward, and the three of them stood outside. Bryce said, You got to look for falling stars. Them are the ones with magic. They were quiet for a long time, all three of them looking up at the sky. Sarah Ruth stopped coughing. Edward thought that maybe she had fallen asleep. There, she said, and she pointed to a star streaking through the night sky. Make a wish, honey, Bryce said, his voice high and tight. That's your star. You make you a wish for anything you want. And even though it was Sarah Ruth's star, Edward wished on it too. All right, guys, that's all the time we have for today. I hope you guys join me tomorrow at the same time to see what happens with Sarah Ruth, Edward, and Bryce. Bye!